not exactly what the original intent. Repentance is just such a word. What does repentance mean? Webster Dictionary defines repentance as to feel sorry or self-reproachful for what one has done or hasn't done. To feel so contrite over one's sin as to change or decide to change one's ways. However, the Greek word, bateano, which means to change one's mind or purpose, it means to change your way of thinking, which then results in your behavior. It changes your mindset. It's much more than being sorry you got caught. It's actually changing the way you think about it. It's changing what you believe. There are many places where examples of repentance is found. These examples may or may not be, use the word exa- uh, repent, but these are some great examples. Jacob at Bethel, Genesis 35, 1 through 3. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, and go to Bethel, dwell there, and make an altar unto God, that it appeared to thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, be clean, and change your garments. Let us arise and go up to Bethel. Notice here, God's instructions to Jacob, and then Jacob's instructions to his household. God told Jacob, arise, get up, and go up to Bethel and dwell there. God told Jacob, get up. First of all, we got to recognize it takes action on our part. We have to make a deliberate, conscious decision. I'm going to do something different. I'm going to get up out of the mess I find myself in. I'm going to get up and I'm going to go to the house of the Lord and I'm going to dwell there. The problem is, in today's society, many people are Easter Christmas Christians. Or at the most, they're one hour on Sunday. But God's plan is for us to dwell in relationship with him. Dwell in the house of the Lord. Dwell with him. If you study the sacrificial plan in the Old Testament, you find out very quickly that there was a lot of activity. There was a lot of involvement. They would take that perfect lamb and they would bring it into the house and they would have make it, keep it in the house with them for three days so that all the kids would get really attached to it. Then they would all go up as a family to the house of God and they would sacrifice it to God. God doesn't want you given something that you don't place value on. God wants your very best. God wants you given him everything. And he wants you heavily involved in it. The reason God, Jesus got so mad at the money changers at the tabernacle was not only were they robbing the people, but they were robbing them of their worship. They made it real easy. They didn't have to raise the sacrifice. They didn't have to... to cleanse that sacrifice they didn't have to walk down the street with the lamb on a leash they just had to show up and throw some money at the money changers and their sacrifice went and got given for them it took the sacrifice out of worship and God is not pleased when we take the sacrifice out of worship That's why we all must be involved. That's why I encourage all of you, get out of that pew, get out in the aisle, and raise your hands. You may not be able to dance and shout the way you could when you were 18, but get out of the aisle. And you say, well, I'm old and I'm tired. I know. But don't take the sacrifice out of worship. Don't take the sacrifice out of worship. God wants all of us to give until it hurts. My poor 16-year-old son has started a healthy lifestyles class, I think is what they call it now. It's a weight training class at at school. Moaning and groaning and carrying on because he's so sore. I just keep telling him, no pain, no gain, boy. And that's the way it is serving God. King David 
said, I will not offer unto God that which costs me nothing. If you don't have to force yourself to get to the house of God sometimes, you're not putting enough effort in. If you only come to God's house when you feel like it and everything's blowing your way and you got the wind at your back, you aren't pushing hard enough. We must serve God diligently. But Jacob told his household, put away the strange gods from among them. Remove anything from your life that separates you from God. Be clean. Cleanse oneself from the filthiness of the flesh and the spirit. Be clean. Change your garments. This is a betrayal of one's need to lay aside the garments of sin and be clothed with salvation. We have to put some effort. We have to put some effort into serving God. We have to put effort into being clean. Put away strange gods. Change your garments. Example two, Nineveh, Jeremiah 35, 3, 5 through 10. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed to fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came into the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and set in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if the Lord will turn and repent and turn away his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them, and he did it not. When the people of Nineveh heard Jonah preaching that they did three things, they fasted. Fasted indicating that the appetites of the flesh are no longer in control. They turned from their evil ways. They stopped their sinning. And they turned from the violence in their land, they, in their hand. The people changed their conduct in every way. Because of that repentance, God saw their works and spared them. We were talking about our New Year's service that we're planning for the end of the year on the way to church. And yeah, I know it's August, but we're talking about our New Year's service. We're talking about how we're planning on coming in and having service at about 8 o'clock and worshiping and then we're going to take a break have some fellowship then come back in pray in the new year have communion and we were talking about how right after that we're going to go into a 21 day fast first of the year we're going to rededicate we're going to refocus we're going to get plugged back in and I understand there's all kinds of fasts, and we talked about this last year, where it could be a complete fast, it could be a no-meat fast, it could be whatever, all sorts of different fasts you can do. But notice here in Nineveh, it was just three days, they had no food and no water. I don't recommend the no water unless you're under doctor supervision, but I know people that have done no food and no water. I have done water only fasts and I know there's some people for health reasons they can't do that but you can drop back something I mean it doesn't count if I only fast rutabagas and turnip greens it doesn't count I don't like those anyway it's no sacrifice on my part but if I only eat rutabagas and turnip greens and give everything else up then that is a huge sacrifice on my part. I'm still eating something, but it's not, it's not counted not as a fast. A friend of mine went on a 40-day broth, vegetable broth only fast. And somebody told her, well, if you're eating vegetable broth, so you're not fasting. And she asked me, and she said, does that, Brian, what do you think? Does it count as a fast or not? I said, well, you tell that person that told you that to only drink vegetable broth for 40 days and then them tell you whether or not they thought it was a fast. 
if you're giving something up for God, if you're sacrificing for God, even if it's just not drinking coffee for 40 days, some of y'all, that would be a huge sacrifice. Some of you, it wouldn't be a sacrifice at all. Some of y'all would rather give up all food and have your coffee than give up your coffee. And I'm not pointing fingers, I'm not condemning, but my point is, when you repent, you got to turn from what it is that has control of you. you got to stop it. you got to cut it out of your life. You've got to get it out of your situation. They fasted. Fasted indicates that the appetites of the flesh are no longer in control. Now, for those of you who may or may not have fasted too much, just expect, if you put your flesh on a fast, your flesh is going to act up. You're going to be cranky. You're going to have a short temper. You're going to be difficult to get along with. Your flesh doesn't like it when you tell it no. Which is why we have to fast on a regular basis. We have to continually keep our flesh under submission. Because let's face it, the Apostle Paul said, there is a war within my members. I battle. That when I would do right, I find myself not doing right. And the things that I should be doing, I find myself not doing. But we have to fight that fight. The old Indian talked about having two wolves inside of him that battled each other. Somebody asked and said, well, which wolf wins? He says, the one I feed the most. So if you're listening to preaching, if you're reading your word, if you're listening to gospel music, if you're, if you're, if you're putting good stuff in, then the spirit man will grow. If you're listening to stuff you shouldn't be listening to, if you're hanging around the wrong people at work, if you're feeding the carnal man, the carnal man's going to grow. So we have to feed the one we want to grow. Because of their repentance, God saw their works and spared them. Example three is Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel 4 and 29. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sin by righteousness, and thy iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. Break off thy sin by righteousness, and by showing mercy. Sometimes you just got to break it off. And it's not easy. It's not hard. It, it's, it can be really, really, really hard sometimes. I know people that have gotten the Holy Ghost and been instantly delivered from alcohol, instantly delivered from cigarettes, instantly delivered from drugs, never had any withdrawals, nothing. And I know other people they battle it and battle it and battle it and they get victory over it for a while and then they fall off the wagon and they battle it some more. But you got to keep battling. You got to break off sin by righteousness. If you fall, get back up. If you fall, repent, say, God, I'm sorry I let my flesh get the upper hand. God, help me do what I should do. God, I'm sorry that I messed up and let my flesh have control. Apostle Paul talks about this in regards to an athlete training. You have somebody who's training for a marathon, a 26-mile marathon. They don't eat chicken fried steak and mashed potatoes with brown gravy. Not for any spiritual reason, but that's not just good food for training for a triathlon. It's not. And just as natural athletes train and control their diet and control their behavior and, and limit what they do, we are on a much more important mission. We are spiritual ambassadors for God in this world. We are representing the Lord Jesus Christ to everybody at the grocery store, at the restaurant, at your work. That is who we are. And we have to repent or turn from sinful behavior. 
we have to break off unrighteousness by righteousness and we have to walk in righteousness now is that easy no church down the street has a sign up this morning that I saw I thought wow I like that sign should have snapped a picture of it it said face makes all things possible doesn't say it makes them easy faith makes all things possible doesn't say it makes them easy we've got to break off sin by righteousness and sometimes it's just pure grit sometimes it's just hard work let me tell you something that I've done that I've learned from my dad years ago sometimes you got to look in the mirror and point your finger at yourself and say Brian you're not gonna act that way anymore sometimes you gotta talk to yourself you gotta look yourself right in the eye in the mirror and say get yourself under control boy sometimes you gotta make up your mind and you just gotta break off sin by righteousness say I'm not doing it anymore is it easy no but here's the thing with the power of the Holy Ghost is possible with the power of the Holy Ghost you can do it the power of the Holy Ghost gives us power to be his witnesses there was a reason Jesus told the Apostles go and wait at Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high because he had seen them all deny him when he went to the cross he knew there was no way they could do it without the Holy Ghost he said, go wait till you get the Holy Ghost and then go be my witnesses. Guess what? Things haven't changed. If Brian doesn't stay full of the Holy Ghost, Brian's not a very good witness. The only chance Brian has to be a good witness is for Brian to come down here and repent and pray through and stay full of the Holy Ghost. And if I stay full of the Holy Ghost, I have power to be his witness. If I don't stay full of the Holy Ghost, guess what? The natural carnal Brian Stevenson shows up and you guys wouldn't like him very much, I promise. He is not a good representation of Jesus Christ. We must stay full of the Holy Ghost and we must repent and we must put things under the blood. Break off thy sin by righteousness. Four things that he had to do. I'm on the bottom of page 30. Seek the Lord and call upon him. We can't do this on our own, guys. We have got to have God's help. Seek the Lord and call upon him. Let the wicked forsake his ways. Stop doing what you shouldn't be doing. And the unrighteous forsake his thoughts and let him return to the Lord. Seek the Lord and call him. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts let him return to the Lord we have to control not only what we do our way but we have to control how we think we have to control our thoughts now is that easy no no it's not because the devil is constantly going to be throwing bad thoughts at your head biggest war we fight for our human fears in our mind the devil has thousands of years of experience playing mind games and he's really good at it we have to control our thinking we have to stop our stinking thinking because the devil is really good at throwing negativity depression doubt fear all sorts of stuff in our mind you're not worthy you'll never measure up you're not gonna make it all sorts of negativity the devil's really good at throwing that in our head but we have to we have to seek God and we have to think the way we have we have to repent we have to live in a constant state of repentance and yes repentance is a key for salvation repentance is the key to salvation but repentance, living in a state of repentance, is the key to staying saved. 
Living in a state of repentance is the key to staying saved. We must live in a state of repentance. We must live in a state of repentance. Isaiah 55 and 7 also shows what results can be expected from repentance. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Abundantly So, covered a lot of the Old Testament. Let's talk about New Testament. Matthew 3 and 8. John the Baptist told his hearers, Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. Michael, will you find Luke 13 and 3 for me, please? Acts 26 and 20. Paul preached, Repent, turn to God, do works, meet for repentance. Jesus himself said, Bring forth, therefore, fruit meets for repentance. Repentance is not saying, I'm sorry. Repentance is meaning it. Repentance is meaning it. Repentance is demonstrating it. Javi, come here. I'm sorry, man. Oh, I'm sorry, man. Oh, I'm sorry, man. Oh, I'm sorry, man. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, forgive me, Hobby. God gets tired of that. Thank you, buddy. God gets tired of that. Are we really sorry we did it? Are we sorry we got caught? How determined are we we're going to change our ways? How determined are we I'm not going to do that anymore? I'm just not. I am going to repent. I'm going to turn about. I'm going to change. That is not going to happen again in my life. Luke 13, 3. I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish bring forth meat fruit meat for repentance there are changes in one thoughts talk conduct and action that indicate repentance these works will follow our asking God for forgiveness and for his help in breaking off old habits the apostle Paul writing to the New Testament church and I didn't look this scripture up this morning you might be able to find it for me Michael but the Bible says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. Now in the old days, thank you Michael, appreciate that. In the old days, you brought a sacrifice and you killed it and the sacrifice was over. It's a lot harder to do this. It is a whole lot harder to sacrifice my own self-will every day to Jesus Christ and tell myself no all day long than it is to do it once a week. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Every day, you've got to tell your flesh no. Holy, acceptable unto God. Meaning you have to clean the sin out of your life. Which is your reasonable service. But notice something there. The Bible says that we must be acceptable to God. There is a lie going around Christianity that accept the Lord Jesus Christ and ye shall be saved. There is nothing in the Bible about you accepting God. 
The question is, is he going to accept you? It doesn't matter whether I accept God. He's God. He's on the throne. He's all, all powerful. He's in control. He is the judge. He is the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He is the ruler. He is the final arbitrator of all things. The question is, am I acceptable to him? I mean, don't get me wrong. It sounds really nice. Accept the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's not what it says. It says keep Brian under control. Keep Brian's flesh under subjection. Make Brian behave the way he's supposed to. Don't do what I'm not supposed to do. Do what I'm supposed to do and present my body every day. Lord Jesus, I hope I'm acceptable to you today. Now, let me be very clear. I do not think God is up there with a sledgehammer waiting on you to make one mistake so he can smash you like a bug. I don't believe that. Don't believe that at all. He is a loving father who wants you to live right and walk right and behave. He wants what's best for you. I don't want my kids doing drugs because I know how it will destroy their lives. I don't want them out stealing because I don't want them spending the night in jail. God doesn't want you committing sin because it's bad for you. It doesn't end well. The reality is if you live according to God's rules and God's laws, life is way better. Way better. Just look at our society. The more you reject God, the farther you get away from God, the more chaotic, the more traumatic, the more horrific it is. We must live a repentant life. And going back to where I started, well, going back up to Isaiah 55 and 7, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Scripture tells us his mercy is renewed every morning and great is his faithfulness. And he is ready and willing to forgive us if we will come to him and ask him, God, please forgive me. Help me do better. But we have to break off our sin by righteousness. Seven works of repentance. I'm on the second half of page 31. Paul, writing to the Corinthian church, he identifies seven works of repentance. These are not events that happen one behind the other. These works happen at the same time. The intensity of each of these seven things may be felt in varying degrees by different people. Paul describes repentance. 2 Corinthians 7 11, For behold this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourself to be clear in this matter. Okay. So you messed up. You watched porn on your phone. What are you doing about it? What carefulness has it wrought in you? How watchful are you of yourself? Have you put software on your phone so that it will send a text message to your wife every time you look at something you shouldn't? What clearing of yourself, removing the guilt? Does your spouse have free access to your phone anytime? Do they know all your passwords? Can they see anything on your phone? Are you hiding stuff? What carefulness, what watchfulness of yourself? I got to watch Brian Stevenson. I got to stay on him. If Brian doesn't stay prayed up, he gets a bad attitude. If Brian Stevenson doesn't pray to get, stay prayed up, he starts doing things he shouldn't do. 
we have to be careful of ourselves. You cannot trust your flesh. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you, is what the Bible says. But the Apostle Paul says, flee youthful lusts. Make no provision for the flesh. You cannot resist your flesh. If you struggle with alcohol, do not start a bar mission work. Don't go there. If that's your besetting sin, pray for somebody else to do it. Don't put yourself in that situation. There is a reason the Bible said go two by two. Go two by two. Clear yourself of guilt, indignation, hatred of sin. I'm mad that the devil tripped me up that way, and the devil's never going to trip me up that way again. Fear of God and of sin's results. We must reverence and honor God. We must have great respect for God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Vehement desire to be righteous. Zeal to do right and work for God. So the question is, what provisions have you put in place? Did you set the computer in the living room with the monitor facing the center of the room where everybody can see what you're looking at? If you have a bad habit of shoplifting every time you go to Walmart, don't go to Walmart by yourself. Better yet, order online and have it delivered to you. We have, we all have a besetting sin. Whether you want to admit it or not, we all have something we struggle with. So what are you doing to put safeguards in place? What are you doing to make sure that doesn't happen? When you are repenting and saying, God, please forgive me, I don't want to do it again. What sort of carefulness, what sort of watchfulness are you putting in place to make sure you don't do it again? God is ready to forgive, and he wants to clear you of all guilt. How much do you hate the sin? Fear of God and of God's and of sin's results. A vehement or a strong desire to be righteous zeal to do right and work for God. Revenge in the sense of giving justice to all and punishment of sin. Revenge in this sense. Revenge, okay devil, you tripped me up, but I'm going to go win six people to God. Okay devil, I fell flat on my face, I messed up, but I'm going to go teach six home Bible studies and I'm going to go witness to 14 people and I'm going to praise to 18 people through to the Holy Ghost. That's the last thing the devil wants. He wants you to say, Oop, you messed up. You're not worthy to do anything. You just you can go to church, but you've got to sit in the back corner and not participate. You're not worthy to do anything. That's a lie from the pits of hell. When you mess up, repent. Put it under the blood. Pray through. Get up and go do the work of God. Get out there and witness. Get out there and pray for people. Work the altars. Worship that much harder. Pray people through to the Holy Ghost. Bring back sliders back to church. Okay, I messed up. I'm sorry. I really mean I'm sorry. I'm putting it under the blood, and I'm going to get out there, and I'm going to take revenge on the devil. I'm going to do something great for God. That's what it means. It does not mean self-flagellation. does not mean beat yourself up. It means get out there and do something about it. Brush yourself off. Get up. Say, okay, here we go again. This time, I'm going to stay prayed up. This time, I'm going to stay accountable to Brother Andrew or Brother Clint or Brother Michael, somebody. I'm going to find somebody, and I'm going to be accountable to them. And they have the right to call me any time and say, what are you doing right this minute? Let me ask you something, guys. Is there anybody in your life that can ask you any question and hold you accountable. Are you accountable to anybody? Some of you, I know, have made yourself accountable to me as your pastor, and I appreciate that. You should. But some of you aren't accountable to anybody. Some of you aren't accountable to your spouse. You're not accountable to your parents. 
you're not accountable to your pastor. You're not accountable to anybody. And that's a problem. That's a real problem. And just so you know, there's people pastors accountable to. There are men of God in my life that have the right to call me anytime. Say, hey, this is what the Lord showed me in prayer. I'm also accountable to the board members of this church. And they have the right to pull me into the office and say, hey. And there are other people that I've made myself accountable to. We all have to be accountable to somebody. We all have to be submitted to somebody. The Bible talks about submission for both men and women. We all must be submitted to somebody. Because here's the thing. The only way that we're going to make heaven is if we keep this flesh submitted to God. And if we live a life of submission and live a life of repentance, if we live in a constant state of repentance and we live in a constant state of submission, it's a whole lot easier when the devil tempts us to say, nope, I'm not going to do that. Nope, I'm going to walk away from that. Nope, devil, you tricked me with that four years ago. You are not getting me with that again. I am determined that's not going to happen. I am adamant I'm not falling that way again. Mark 1, 14 through 15, from the top of page 32. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Mark 2 and 17, I came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Luke 3, 13 and 3. Luke 24 and 47, repentance and remission of sins preached